Trina. Trina, I'm just going to get your keyboard and mouse set up here. You should be good to go. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I guess good morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, I'm happy to be speaking with you today. Um, I am also on the board of directors of CFAM, which is Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Marijuana. So certainly um, issues surrounding medical uh, cannabis and access to medical cannabis are ones that are important to me. So I'm happy to be um, speaking with you primarily today about really what's changing um, as far as what we had for access to medical cannabis, you know, up to um, the 17th of October versus what we have now moving forward. So really quickly, just to kind of give you, again, a, 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 a snapshot of where we've come in Canada. We've had access to cannabis for medical purposes in Canada since 2001, um, initially under the MMARs, the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations. Um, government made a policy change in uh, 2013, which led to the introduction of the MMPRs in 2014. Um, those of you who have um, you know, been using medical cannabis for since then will remember that th the purpose of that was to, to privatize the commercial production of medical cannabis and to remove the personal growing rights. Um, and as a result of a court challenge to that, uh, we moved into the ACMPRs in 2016, the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations, um, which is, those are the regulations that were in, in, in force right up until October 17th. So, all of those regulations up until the 17th of October were regulations to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So the CDSA contained prohibitions basically on activities with, you know, um, cannabis and all other narcotics. Um, but now what we have as of the 17th of October is the, can the Federal Cannabis Act. And so what's happened is that kind of all activities relating to cannabis and cannabis alone have been um, brought under the umbrella of this one piece of legislation. So we now have, um, you know, a very long set of regulations to the Cannabis Act. I think it's over 300 pages long. And one part of the, the cannabis regulations, part 14 in particular, is called um, the access, uh, is called, is entitled access to cannabis for medical purposes. So what happened as of October 17th um, is that uh, the, the access to cannabis regulations, uh, to, for medical purposes regulations, the ACMPRs under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act were repealed, and the Cannabis Act and its regulations came into force. So just to give you a quick snapshot then of the timeline that, that um, uh, has occurred with legalization of, of adult use cannabis, we had Bill C-45 introduced uh, last April, passing the House of Commons in November, um, passing the Senate and getting royal assent in June, um, then we saw the regulations in July, and everything basically came into force on October 17th. So moving forward now, what will be relevant, I'll talk about this in a little bit more, there'll be some packaging and labeling um, changes mandated by next April for medical um, to bring them in line with adult use. There'll be um, uh, introduction of regulations to um, allow edibles and concentrates to enter the legal framework. That will happen at some point no later than October 17th next year. And then at the three year mark, there will be um, a review of the Cannabis Act and um, an assessment of you know, how things are going. And, and that will be an important one for a review for medical cannabis patients because it will probably in also involve uh, an assessment of, of you know, what purpose the medical stream serves and whether it should um, continue. So, uh, so yeah, as I said, ACMPR replaced by the new cannabis regulations, um, specifically part 14 of those regulations is uh, the part of the regulations that addresses access to cannabis for medical purposes. And if you were a medical cannabis patient, either uh, growing your own medical cannabis or purchasing it from a licensed producer or having somebody grow for you under the ACMPR, those authorizations automatically transition forward into the Cannabis Act. So there's really nothing that you need to do. So really what I wanted to focus mostly on today is what's changed, um, because to a large extent, what we see in part 14 of the cannabis regulations looks very similar to what we saw in the ACMPRs. So I just wanna, I'm gonna highlight 10 changes for you. Um, and I'll just, you know, just list them out at a high level first, and then we'll talk about a little bit more about each one in, in detail. So first is product labeling and packaging. Up until this point, 
you know, from the date that the MMPRs came into force until the 17th, and even actually for the next six months, um, licensed producers have had a little more, I mean, certainly there's been prescribed labeling, but there's, and, and some rules about packaging, but not to the extent that we have now. So you're going to see the products that you're purchasing um, from licensed producers um, changing to look very plain, uh, you know, similar to what we have for tobacco. Um, whereas we previously had patient information printed right onto the product label that was affixed to each product that was shipped, that, that is changing, that's being removed. Your monthly purchasing limit is, has been removed. Um, the information that's on your patient registration document is, is changing, it's expanding. Um, the, the date of expiration of your medical, uh, your registration is going to change based on the date of your um, of registration, not your medical document. Again, I'll go through all this in a little more detail in a minute. The ability to transfer or request the return of your medical document, um, the expiration of your medical document, uh, new product forms that are, are not only going to become available next year with cannabis edibles and concentrates, but also are available now. Um, the removal of storage limits for personal growers and excise tax. So also if you want it, I've, I've included a little link to a page on Health Canada's website that um, highlights a lot of these changes as well. So the first um, change of course is, is about product labeling and packaging. So this is an example um, of, of the kind of plain-ish packaging that Health Canada has prescribed um, under the Cannabis Act moving forward. So this packaging is going to apply to, to, to cannabis products, no matter if you are purchasing them for medical or adult use purposes, the packaging will look the same. Um, but what's happened is um, the, the products that are in the medical stream are being given a six month period within which to switch over. So essentially it's a sell off period for licensed producers to sell off their, their current inventory that is already packaged and, and ready for sale. Um, but within that six month period, if you haven't already seen a switch in the products that you're purchasing from licensed producers to look like this, you will see that over the, over the next six months because they, within that six month period, they must follow these rules for packaging. So they you know, must have this new universal um, symbol for cannabis contained on them. They must have the, uh, the rotating warning um, uh, notices in, in, in yellow on the page and very um, strict um, guidelines about, again, the other prescribed information that has to be on there and, you know, how they can um, show uh, brand and strain specific information. Um, you will not see your information on that packaging any longer, your specific personal information. So that, yeah, that leads me into the, the very next topic, which is, is the pa patient info on the label? So there's no client label affixed to the product any longer. Um, so uh, as a result, you know, the product itself, the package itself will not identify you as a medical cannabis patient because the products that you purchased from licensed processors for the most part will look the same as products that you would purchase through the adult use market. Now, it may be that certain um, uh, licensed producers, and I'm calling them licensed producers, but really they're going to be medical sellers. It's a specific license that you will need to hold a sales for medical purposes license. That is what will allow um, companies to sell directly to you medical patients, but those sellers, um, the products that are being sold by them, they may choose to, um, you know, have specific branding for the medical stream only, which you may not find in the adult use stream, but there also may, but, but, but there may be some commonality and overlap, but generally speaking, the rules about how those products are, are cultivated and processed and packaged and labeled will be identical no matter what stream you're talking about. So for, you know, for example, I know many people are concerned about uh, when they're carrying medical cannabis with them outside of their home, um, you know, what do they need to, uh, to carry with them to, to prove that it's, it's medical cannabis and to therefore, you know, remove the 30 gram limit for public possession. And so, you know, we, we, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but it's important to recognize that the product in and of itself isn't going to be that proof because that could be the exact same product that you could be purchasing from a, a cannabis, uh, an adult use cannabis retail store. Up until um, the 17th of October, licensed producers were restricted in the um, amount of cannabis they could sell to patients within any 30 day period. Um, and that was creating some um, uh, 
supply stress for patients because they were limited to purchasing a 30-day supply in any given 30-day period. Um, and so, you know, if there was a, a loss of medication or if there was a concern that there might be a shortage um, when it came time to place the next order, it still limited the amount that you were allowed to purchase in any one 30-day period. So that, that restriction has been lifted now. Um, not to say that there aren't still supply issues, because there there certainly are right now. But but you you know the amount that you are allowed to purchase, subject to availability, is has been removed, or the the cap. Um, so the patient registration um, process and the information that you are receiving when you register with a a, a licensed medical seller um, has changed a little bit too. Uh, what you will get if you want to purchase those you know finished packaged products. Um, will be a registration document. So previously, your patient-specific information was put on a client label, which went on to the product itself. As we already discussed, that's not going to be the case any longer. And instead, the information that will be contained on your registration document is going to be um, supplemented and include a lot of that information that would have previously gone on the client label. So that registration document is going to become an important document that you need to gonna, gonna need to keep um, handy going forward. So, um, so oh, expiration of personal production registration. So if you are producing your own medical cannabis or someone's producing on your behalf, there was a great deal of stress um, around the, the processing of renewal applications. And um, certainly a backlog, um, you know, with Health Canada and some stress about if that if that renewal was not processed, what did that mean? Did I have to destroy my plants? Do, you know, what what ha what's the result of that? So that uncertainty has been removed um, with this new section of the cannabis regulations, which says basically as long as you submit your renewal application before the expiration of your current registration, it remains valid until you get a decision from Health Canada about that renewal. So you don't have to worry if the actual expiration date passes and you still haven't received a response to your renewal request. Under the ACMPR, once you um, submitted your original medical document to a licensed producer, you could never get it back again. And this was um, certainly a pretty major criticism of the system um, since its introduction uh, because it is a hassle to have to go back to a physician or a nurse practitioner and obtain a whole new medical document just because there, for whatever reason you wanted to switch to a different licensed producer. Um, so that now has been, um, certainly you still have to, reg the registration is still specific to that one seller. Um, that remains, but your ability to transfer your registration or your medical document from one seller to another has, um, has been facilitated in the new regulations. So not only is it permitted now, but in fact, there's an obligation on those medical sellers to actually return or transfer your medical document when you request it without delay. Um, what I've heard thus far is that, that that process has been going quite smoothly and the licensed producers, now the licensed sellers have been complying with those requests in a timely way and where a change is desired by the patient that's being, that's being facilitated. So we still have quite restricted product types available um, under the Cannabis Act for now. Um, basically, that the forms of can the types of cannabis that, that are able to be sold in both the medical and the adult use systems are restricted to dried cannabis and cannabis oil with a limited concentration of 30 milligrams per milliliter. Um, and that is going to be the case until we see edibles and concentrates um, come into force next year. Um, as I said, the Cannabis Act mandates those regulations to come into force by October 17th. Essentially, if they haven't brought something into effect by those dates, these product types just become permissible without regulation. And that, that's certainly not going to happen. So we will see cannabis um, edible and concentrate regulations in force by October 17th next year, hopefully sooner. You know, we, I, I expect to see a part one publication in the Gazette of these regulations uh, at some point over the winter, hopefully in the coming months with a consultation period on the regulations. And, you know, hopefully we can get these new regulations in force as soon as possible. Certainly, many of these new product types are, 
are definitely highly anticipated by both in both the adult use and the medical uh, streams. So, uh, but the interesting thing is the way that those product types can be presented to consumers and packaged for consumers has been has been broadened somewhat. So. For example, we now have the ability to um, sell pre-rolls of dried cannabis, and that was not the case prior to October 17th. So there are some you know, new forms that we're seeing. Um, and we're also seeing continued product innovation within those current restricted product types. So you may have taken note that uh, Aurora announced a new product, Aurora Cloud, last week, I believe, which is, uh, or maybe two weeks ago now, which is a, um, a CBD um, oil a vape cartridge. So, you know, next year when concentrates come into effect, we will see, we will see vape cartridges come online with, with higher levels of THC. Um, but in the meantime, we do have it available in a CBD oil format. Uh, if you're producing your own cannabis or, or having a designated grower grow for you in the ACMPR, there were limits on the amount of cannabis you were allowed to store. Uh, and it, you know, it was a formula that was, was patient specific based on um, how, what, what your medical document um, prescribed for you as far as number of grams per day and also whether you were growing indoors or outdoors. But that's been removed. Um, uh, there is no storage limit any longer. I mean, you still have to grow no more than the number of plants that are authorized based on your medical document, but the amount of cannabis that you are allowed to um, to store, which is cultivated from those plants, is unlimited. And that was basically just the federal government um, recognizing it didn't really make sense to say in the adult use stream that there is no limit federally on the amount of cannabis that you could store privately, but that there would be for medical patients. That doesn't, there's no real um, logic to that. So that storage limit has been removed. There are a few provinces, Quebec and BC, that have imposed um, private possession limits at a provincial level, but those restrictions don't apply to medical cannabis. Uh, and then there's the excise tax. Now, depending on where you are and where your licensed producer is, um, you probably are already charged GST and or HST on your medical cannabis, but um, we're also now as of the 17th seeing the imposition of new excise duties. So these are, um, Unfortunately, for now, being applied to all cannabis products um, that have more than 0.3% THC in them. Uh, and so again, no distinction drawn between whether the use is adult use or medical, the distinction is purely on the amount of THC in the product. And uh, you know, the, the, the actual calculation of the excise duty is actually quite complicated. Um, so uh, at a very high level, you know, it's, you know, on average, and depends on what province you're in, about 10%, which is um, paid by the packager of the product, the processor who is actually packaging uh, the product. So it is not um, a, a tax or a duty that is visible to the consumer. It's built into the price of products. Um, certainly CFAM and others are advocating very strongly for the removal of excise tax from medical cannabis. Um, the, the rationale uh, for for you know, applying it to medical cannabis products that, that have more than 0.3% THC in them that was provided by the federal government, I think is a very unsatisfactory one because it was basically, you know, what, what I heard was we don't want to create incentives for people to, um, you know, fake their way into the medical stream. Um, so, you know, we want to tax everything equally, but you know, I personally feel it's quite offensive to have what's, you know, colloquially known as a, a sin tax on medicine. So, you know, I, I, I hope that we can continue to apply um, political pressure in that regard and affect change um, soon. And in the meantime, several of the licensed producers have confirmed their intention to absorb that excise duty and not pass it on to patients. So in other words, not to raise the price of the products that they're selling to, to compensate for the additional duty that they're having to remit to the government. So some of the issues I'm asked about quite frequently now surrounding legalization, I thought I'd talk about briefly. Um, landlords and condo boards, or stratas if you're in BC, uh, is certainly a big issue. And it's not, in the medical context, it's not like there's anything new happening here. The duty for landlords and condo boards to accommodate medical cannabis use existed before October 17th and it still exists today. 
But the reason this issue is becoming to the, is coming to the forefront is that with legalization, um, we're seeing um, cannabis-specific uh, policies or rules related to consumption and cultivation imposed by landlords and condo boards that just they didn't even um, feel a need for previously. So uh, where there may, may have been no policy or no cannabis-specific policy uh, prior, now we're seeing cannabis-specific policies introduced. And the problem is that in some cases, um, they're not making accommodation for medical use. So that's, that's a problem. If a landlord or a condo board is trying to impose a blanket uh, prohibition on cultivating or consuming cannabis for any purpose, um, I think that's a human rights issue. And, and I expect in those cases that we will see challenges to human rights tribunals, challenges to landlord and tenant boards. Um, across the country uh, about that duty to accommodate. I think probably see it in the adult use um, context as well, but certainly there are human rights issues triggered in the medical context. So, you know, and, and the issues are going to be tricky because it's not just about do, do you have to, um, you know, do you have to permit this? It's to what extent do you have to permit it? Because, you know, it's not accommodation uh, uh, obligations that are unfettered. It's accommodation to the point of undue hardship. So you were going to see really interesting or tricky cases, frankly. Um, I think it's not so tricky in the context of, you know, a right to consume or cultivate medicine versus um, nuisance. So if your next door neighbor just doesn't like to smell, um, I think the medical context will probably trump in that case. But we're seeing stories in the media about people who claim to have a sensitivity or an allergy to cannabis or cannabis um, smoke or vapor and so when you have, you know, two kind of medical contexts competing against each other, uh, we're going to have to see how courts and tribunals analyze that and address it. And also interesting to see in the context of medical cannabis consumption, how courts and tribunals will uh, assess the right to choose the method of consumption of your medicine. So do you have the right to choose to smoke or vaporize your cannabis versus to um, to consume it in a non-combustible, non-vaping form. And, you know, I think that will probably end up to be a, a patient-specific analysis, and it will probably uh, take into account your specific symptoms or conditions that you're treating with medical cannabis and what the effect is on those symptoms or conditions by consuming it in different ways. Um, but, but we will, I'm sure, see in a legal context some analysis of those issues over the upcoming several years. Consumption. So now at a federal level, obviously consumption or, um, you know, possession of up to 30 grams of, of, of cannabis for adult use is legal. Um, in the medical context, the same rules still apply where it's up to, um, it's a 30 day supply up to a maximum of 150 grams in public. Um, but public consumption rules, um, we don't have a nice clean rule that applies everywhere. They really are all over the map. Um, so generally speaking, you need to look to your province and you need to specifically look to your municipality for the rules about cannabis consumption um, because they do vary. They vary from province to province. They vary from municipality to municipality. Uh, and, you know, many do make accommodation for medical consumption, but some don't. So again, here's another context where we may see some challenges if, if um, you know, you're in a particular location where you believe a provincial law or a municipal bylaw doesn't properly accommodate your medical cannabis consumption in a public place. And another question I see asked often is, you know, how am I allowed to, how should I transport my medica, medical cannabis? How do I prove that I'm a medical cannabis patient? How do I prove that the cannabis in my possession is legal cannabis and not illicit cannabis? Um, so as far as transporting in a vehicle, follow your provincial rules. So for example, in Ontario, our Cannabis Act now says that you, know, you, can, you can transport can cannabis in a vehicle as long as it's either you know, still sealed in its original packaging or it's, you know, it's, an it's in an enclosed package and it's not readily accessible to anybody in the vehicle. Now, if you look in the regulations, then they say, but if it's medical cannabis, it just can't be accessible to the driver. So 
the rules are a little bit more liberal as far as transporting medical cannabis than adult use cannabis, but you still have to follow those rules. And those rules are province specific. So you have to make sure you are um, determining what those rules are based upon what province you're in. And, you know, so just some general tips about transporting to try to avoid issues if you do, you know, have an encounter with law enforcement and they're asking you about the cannabis in your possession. I mean, the easiest thing to do, frankly, is to keep it in its original packaging if possible. I, I understand that's not always going to be possible. So if you if it isn't in its original packaging, um, then carry a copy copy of your purchase receipt. Um, if it's if it's cannabis that you've cultivated yourself at home, either for adult use or for medical, then you know I would say carry a copy of your registration certificate with you with Health Canada, which shows that you're authorized to do that if it's for medical purposes. Um, if it's for adult use purposes, carry a copy of your receipt where you purchased the seeds or the clones that were used to grow those plants. If you, if you did purchase in the medical stream from a licensed seller, carry your registration document with you. Um, you know, it, obviously the easiest thing would be to keep a digital copy on your phone that you could show if needed. Some people don't feel comfortable with handing over their phone to law enforcement. So if that's the case, then just keep, you know, a hard copy in your glove compartment box or in your purse or, you know, somewhere where you could show it if need be. So all that said, you know, there, there, you know things have improved for medical cannabis access. There's no question as far as the, the legal framework and how the regulations are structured. But, you know, there's still obviously some pretty significant issues that medical patients are facing. Um, probably the most pressing one right now is that we're hearing many stories of, of um, licensed producers having shortages of, 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 of inventory available for medical patients. So um, that's unfortunate. And certainly it, it, it has to be due in large part to the demand um, on those producers from the provincial distributors with whom they've signed supply deals for adult, the adult use market. Uh, hopefully we can get those shortages straightened out in short order. In the meantime, you know, at least there is transferability of medical documents, um, but you know, it, it, this is a problem right now. The continued lack of storefront sales. So I certainly had hoped that legalization would uh, include the ability for medical cannabis to be sold within pharmacies. We didn't see that. There's still a few roadblocks, um, you know, ahead of us that we have to work through to, to, to make that happen, but it is something that is being worked on, um, and hopefully we will see um, that introduction of pharmacy sales of medical cannabis in the not-too-distant future. Uh, HST and GST, you know, it should be um, zero rated as far as I'm concerned for that purpose as well, and, and it should not be um, charged on just like it isn't charged on any prescription drug. Um, but again, that, that's something that we're going to have to continue to advocate for. We're seeing some, certainly some, uh, some progress and momentum as far as um, coverage under benefits plans, whether it's um, with the use of um, wellness allowances or pseudodins or other mechanisms, you know, that the main hindrance here has been the lack of of, of DINs for most cannabis products, but, um, but, but that's improving, but still, you know, there's no question that the bulk of Canadians who are medical cannabis patients don't have probably coverage for, for their medicine and the cost is definitely an issue and that's something we have to continue to, to work on. Um, you know, around leading up to legalization, we heard a continued and a repeated um, statement by, um, you know, bodies such as the, the Canadian Medical Association to eliminate the medical stream for cannabis completely. Um, so it's going to be up to, you know, um, advocacy groups and patients to continue to let the government know why it's so important to continue to have a separate medical stream for cannabis. Um, and there is an ongoing stigma and there is an ongoing reluctance of many physicians to, to provide medical documents. So that's something that we're going to have to continue to work on too, improving education, imp expanding the evidence base that would, um, that would help cause more physicians to feel comfortable enough to provide medical documents to patients. So that's really all I had today. Um, and that's, uh, so happy to, you know, answer questions that anyone has at this point. Um, yep. I do see a question. Oh, sorry, Allison, go ahead. No, that's okay. I was just going to jump in just to remind everybody uh, 
just to make sure everybody knows that uh, you can uh, ask any questions to Trina by typing into the questions panel in your GoToWebinar panel. And now's the time to do it. We've got lots of time for questions. So yeah, uh, you can see the questions there, Trina? Yep. Um, Perfect, so go right ahead. Questions. Yeah, will my doctor be notified if I transfer LPs? Um, I think that's probably a question that you want to ask the specific licensed seller that you're transferring to what their pro because there are obligations on sellers to verify um, the medical document and to confirm um, its its validity and and typically that's done by reaching out and contacting the doctor's office directly so um, uh, that and that is typically done you know when when the registration the initial registration occurs whether or not they're doing that upon transfers I'm actually not sure but I think that's just a process issue that you would want to um, confirm with your your particular uh, seller that you're moving to um, next question was about wondering about topical uh, creams um, so it, I mean, there. I think there are a few things that are. I mean, it's 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 not technically permitted right now because it it doesn't easily fall within the, the categories, the permissible categories of dried cannabis or cannabis oil. I think there are a few products on the market though that you know. Be, and and the problem with the oil is what the regulations say is that it has to be in liquid form at room temperature. So that that forms another problem for for calling it a cream. Um, so, but there, I think there have been some innovative solutions and workarounds to that in the meantime with, you know, refrigerating and it, you know, becomes solid when it's at refrigerated temperature and things like that. But it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very limited um, uh, uh, availability right now. So I think, yes, as we move into concentrates and edibles, uh, I, I would ex fully expect that topicals will be part of that and, and they will enter both the medical and the adult use streams next year at some point. Um, and the other question was, are we able to get topical cream from other provinces and receive it via mail? So in the adult use market, no, there's going to be no kind of cross border, um, delivery of on, on online stores will be required to only sell to address to people in a, with addresses within that province. Uh, in the, in the medical stream, it's regulated federally. So no matter where the licensed seller is that you are registered with, it doesn't matter where in Canada they are, they can ship to you. And again, the, the types of products that will be available for sale will be consistent, whether we're talking adult use or recre or, or, um, or medical. So we will, when we see those types of products coming online and be available through the new regulations, they'll be available in both streams. What are the differences with driving while using cannabis? I could be on high dose opioids and only need to do a field sobriety test. Uh, I'm not gonna get into impaired driving today because it's not really what I do. I'm not a criminal defense lawyer and it's not um, something that I'm focused on. Obviously, um, there's a great deal of concern over the changes that were made to impaired driving legislation federally uh, in Bill C-46 leading up to legalization. In particular, the per se limits that are contained within that legislation and the uh, requirement to provide a roadside sample even in the absence of any kind of reasonable um, basis for believing there's impairment. Those are things that are very concerning from a, um, you know, a civil, civil liberties perspective. And I do believe, you know, probably pretty soon after um, we start seeing people be charged under those particular provisions, we'll see charter challenges to them. Um, and you know, certainly there's no specific kind of carve out or special rules or anything for medical cannabis patients. And that's a problem for people who are dosing their medical cannabis on a consistent basis. So um, I think I'll just kind of leave it as saying it's problematic, it's concerning. Um, and, and yes, certain substances, including cannabis, have been targeted specifically with these per se limits. And it certainly doesn't include everything that could possibly be impairing. So uh, we're going to have to keep our eye on how those laws are applied, and you know there will be challenges to those laws. Um, discussions in looking at making recognition of medical users as simple as a health card. I mean, certainly that's yes, that's 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 been an issue that's been talked about. I can't tell you. I don't know exactly to what extent the federal government has actually 
considered it or you know worked on it i don't know certainly the the comment has i know been made to the federal government that there's you know there should be kind of a consistent standard way across the country for patients to um, identify themselves as being medical cannabis patients but the problem is that it is federally regulated the healthcare system is provincial and so it would involve a great deal of coordination to try to build something in um, to your health card for example uh, I know there have been um, companies that have, you know, looked at maybe some type of um, card that could be a specific, like a, a, can, a medical cannabis card specifically that would be kind of universally recognized by law enforcement as being such and identifying people um, haven't seen actually anything of that nature come onto the market. So really the best we have right now is your registration document with the licensed seller that you're purchasing your medical cannabis from. So um, you know, it's it's not probably in the most kind of convenient form of a card or something that you could slip into your wallet at this point, but that's um, that's the best we have at this point. So that's all the questions that we have right now. I don't know if anybody else wants to throw anything out there before we wrap up. Oh, I just saw one more come in there, Trina. Oh, there we go, where there'll be a difference in potency between medical cannabis products versus um, versus adult use ones? That's a really great question that we don't know the answer to yet. So um, I know that the government, the federal government has made comments surrounding the fact that they certainly, you know, recognize that there may be um, legitimate reasons why medical patients would require higher concentrated products. Um, at the same time, they, again, don't want to create discrepancies where they don't have to between the two streams because they don't want to create incentives for people to move, you know, from one stream to the other um, for that reason. So they, you know, for example, the, the concern is if we, if we um, allow higher concentrations of medical products, is that going to cause people who otherwise would just be buying for recreational purposes to, 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 to seek out a medical document to enter the medical system for access to those products? So I don't really know where we're going to land on that yet. We're going to have to see what the draft regulations say. Uh, we're going to have to certainly, you know, th th there's been submissions made to the federal government that there should be no caps on either stream and that really we should allow the industry to, to deliver the products to consumers that they're seeking. But that, of course, is going to be balanced against the public health and safety concerns and wanting to make sure that we're not um, unduly um, creating situations for people to um, unintentionally uh, ingest more than they intended and to have a negative outcome as a result. So um, so I'm not sure where exactly we're going to land there. There's lots of interesting issues to think about. And I would just suggest if it, you know, if it matters to you, keep an eye when those regulations are released in draft form and that consultation period opens. And, and then feel free to make submissions to the federal government uh, in response to the position that they're taking on that issue. Okay, we have another question about medical cannabis when you are traveling to a state where cannabis is legal, such as California or Colorado, can you take your medical cannabis with you? No, you cannot cross um, that international border into the US with, with cannabis for any purpose in your possession. Uh, cannabis, even for medical purposes, is not recognized federally in the US. So even if you are traveling directly into a state where it is, the problem is border control is a federal matter in the US and, and they are certainly taking the position that you cannot bring any cannabis with you. So um, you know that's a problem for medical patients, there's no question. And you know if you are going to be in the US in a state where medical cannabis is, is legal for an extended period of time, you might want to look into whether it's possible to get an authorization in that state so you could access it when you're there, but it can't cross the border between Canada and the U.S. with you without, um, you know, exposing yourself to significant legal risk. Um, and and, and, and that, that's not just the U.S., obviously, that's, that's anywhere. So, you know, I, I think probably every airport that you go to in the country now, I'm sure, their signage, um, you know, basically reminding and warning people of that, that, you know, just because it's legal here doesn't mean it's legal anywhere else and don't take it with you. Um, I guess that's it. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's the end of our questions. Thanks so much to everybody who uh, who asked a question. There were some really good questions in there.